Holy shit. It's me. I'm live. I guess we're doing another movie review. So let me invite the old cage man in here. Let me invite the old, the old Kaylin in. Let me get him on in here. Did that invite stand? There he is. Did he get invite? Did he get invite? In get invited to the room. Let me. Oh, would you look at that? It's my co host. What are we calling this show now? Did you see that? Did you? What are we calling it? Uh, hey, did you see this one? Hey, did you see this one? Hey, did you see this one? Episode seven. Episode seven. We've done it. Seven already? Okay. Oh, yeah, man. We've been doing this for a minute now. It's only been a week since our last episode. I figured after the glowing success of last week, we would just hit hit him hit him where it hurt with more goodness. Oh, it hurts so good. We watched the 1955 James Dean classic Rebel Without a Cause. Oh, squinty eyes. It was he is the epitome of the meme that's like, <laughs> uh, he. James Dean is like freakishly good looking. Like he's like like he there's like handsome people, you know, and then he goes to like keeps going to like kind of weird looking handsome and voice is fucking weird. I'm a fan. <laughs> I, I I have a man crush on him. Uh I don't know about freakish I mean maybe at the time. I think for the time his his looks were ahead of their time. I also find it hilarious that he's probably 25 or 26 in this movie, and he's playing a... They never say his age. He's 24. They never say his age, but he's supposed to be under under 18. Yeah, he's like, yeah, second 17. Yeah, he's in, he's in school. Yeah. So, before we get to the movie, how was your week, Kalen? Uh, I was a dad last night. Yeah, you said something about that last, last time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so my week good thank you uh still alive uh still employed and um i got a little i got a little role on a t show called these woods are haunted where i play hannah's dad cool um it wasn't my strong suit but you know i'll take what i can get and hopefully it leads to other things where can we watch that show when does it air is it a t- is it a web series is it a I think it's a Discovery Channel sh- uh, show production or something. Uh, it'll probably be a few months, and you can like you can definitely YouTube some of the the episodes. It, pr- it probably has its own website. I I real <laughs> I mean, even though I, I got a pardon, I really don't know that much about it. And then after checking out like one of the episodes on you, it's not really my style of show that I would watch. Nothing against you know those involved or whatever. Uh, no, it's like a it's like a. I don't even really know how to explain it. I call it, it I, I, the, the words that came to mind were a parody docu, where it's like, it's like, it's almost like a Blair Witch Project kind of thing, sort of. Uh, a, a parody docu series is also known as a mockumentary. Oh, okay. Maybe that's, there you go. That's much cool. like, much like, you know, Spinal Tap, uh, much like The Office, I would consider a mockumentary. Yeah. The Office is a mockumentary. Maybe that's not the right word for it, that. Um, because it's not in the, the real world of the characters. It's not a joke. Right. Oh, okay. And it's like, it's like, it's like these, it's like interviewing these, well, so the episode that I saw online was like, they interviewed these guys who like saw Bigfoot or something. And then, they okay. cut, <laughs> yeah. And then they cut to scenes of like, you know, spooky, you know, element scenes or whatever kind of thing. So it's like, um, maybe like a parody of ghost hunters kind of shows. Maybe I'm not, but uh, parody is the right word because I think they're trying to be. So it's like a it's it's a drama, but it's like shot like a mockumentary. No, I don't, you know I, I take it back. It's not it's not shot. Like, uh, maybe no, I don't know. I don't think it's shot like a mockumentary. Did you do a Talking Head where you were like, I didn't know what to think? No, not not my character. So my, I was just Anna, like Anna's dad was like, or sorry, Anna was like the main character of the episode or whatever. And so I was just playing her dad. And then, so I was in like some of the scenes like that they cut to for the story that she tells. Okay. So I don't, I don't like whatever you want to call that. I don't know. And we, you know, we were, we were in the woods. We were supposed to be scared of, you know, things that were in the woods. Were you scared for reals? Uh, no, I was not scared for real. And I don't jet like in my real, real life. I don't risk scare easily. Like the, there's not, very much that I'm scared of per se. Okay. Uh, and uh so it was kind of hard to draw realism or whatever. 
But at the same time, the director guy was like, you know, you're kind of like nonchalant, don't really believe, you know, that there's actually anything there. So like, I, wa I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't trying to dial up. I was like maybe around a four or a five or something, concerned or, or alarm or whatever. That's interesting. I'll have to check that show out. It seems, uh, seems interesting, but you say it's not really your kind of show, so. It, it's the, no, because it, it, no. <laughs> It, it's because it's it's like I, I mean I already know like TVs are fake. What? Like, <laughs> See, the next thing you're gonna tell me is professional wrestling is fake. It's very it's a very beautiful dance. How was your week, sir? <laughs> um, I had a lovely week of work. Uh, we recorded the season finale of Blow Off Somebody on Wednesday. Um, I went for a nice long walk last night and got stoned up in the in the old ravine. You got the, what? You got stoned? Yeah, I got stoned in the ravine. We have a ravine That's pretty close by. Stone? Yeah. So in the summertime, I walk in there. <laughs> what? Yeah. I walk through there and smoke a little of that legal gange, and uh, it's it's nice. Um, it was just to say it's you know you guys are feeling it now in Halifax. We've been in the perpetual lockdown for quite some time. So I've been living that groundhog day pretty much all winter. And now that it's warmed up, I can get out. I can get out onto the uh, the old streets and pound the pavement and fuck around uh, a bit. But it's been, I've been 15 months of just like my apartment, basically. We had a barbecue today. That was cool. What did you do today? We had a barbecue today. Nice steak. Got steak, steak, chorizo, made a chorizo sausage, uh, some garlic and onion potatoes. Very nice. So let's talk about let's talk about Rebel Without a Cause, directed by Nicholas Ray, based on a play, as it's as it appears to say at the beginning of the movie. Um, I did some research on this movie. I didn't. I took pretty extensive notes. I didn't uh, do much research. I'm just looking at the Wikipedia right now. I thought this uh, compared to movies of today. Yeah, this wasn't too much different. Like uh, as far as teen like teen dramas go, it reminded me the part later in the movie where it's the three of them in the like abandoned mansion reminded yeah. me of the uh, Breakfast Club sort of vibe. Um, I thought James Dean was actually a fucking pretty phenomenal actor. I always kind of thought he was a ham and he was just like a like a pretty boy, but you never cared. But I've never seen anything. And this, I didn't know that this was this movie. I thought this was, isn't, doesn't he do like a biker movie at one point? There's so he's got three movies. And he, so I have all three. And uh, the first one was Beast of Eden. And you got to check that one because that one, awesome, phenomenal, awesome. Um, kind of like a, another kind of like teen drama kind of thing or whatever. This was the second one. And he only was able to do like he was supposed to do. So the third movie that he did is called Giant. And the scheduling for that one, he wasn't going to be able to do this one. But then the actress in that one got pregnant. So that one got postponed. And so he was able to do this one. So he's uh, did like this within a year and then died and like uh, a month before this month, this one came out. And, uh, and, you know, the rest is uh, his. Dude, he would have been, I'm sure this has been talked about to death, but he would have been a crazy star in the 60s. Like, cr like crazy it, he is so good in this movie. Yeah. Wait. And not in like, not in like a full on, like, it's really subtle. It's not like, obviously this guy's a good actor. It's, it's one of those, like, he, he, he makes these really subtle choices that are unlike, it's kind of like, um, kind of like, uh, what's his face from, uh, Psycho. Jason, or, um, no, 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 not American Psycho, uh, who's the actor. Andy Perkins plays Norman Bates. Psycho. Huh? What? I think Vince Vaughn played the, 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 there was like a remake. Or like the a remake. remake. Yeah. There's uh there's like sequels too that are canon to the original Psycho with other, I don't know if Anthony Perkins reprises his role, but Anthony Perkins, if you watch his, his acting in the original Psycho, it's very um nuanced and it's very ahead of his time. He looked like an actor plucked out of time and sent back to the 1960s. And I thought that, uh, I thought that, um, <clears throat> Uh, James Dean had that vibe going. Also, Natalie Wood had that going for her too. 
she was kind of wooden she was kind of like whatever as an actor yep she, she seemed like a more like she seemed like a modern actor i also um does this movie exist in black and white or is it always yeah. color so the movie was supposed to be made in black and white and they shot i think two or three scenes um, but there was so one of the the main um, the main uh, what's where I went for the main reason or the main you know reason that they say anyway for it being in color is that um, I actually have it written down somewhere. What's it called panoscope or whatever it's called? It's, pan- it's panorama or panoscope. Yeah, it's not Technicolor. It's Technicolor. Oh, cinescope. So cinescope has a, a clause or whatever in his contract that it's if you use their film, you have to shoot in color. So. Okay. There, there was one or two other rumors about the reason for it, but that's like the end is that it was, it was like they were contractually obligated to do it. And, um, and then because, so I guess originally he was wearing like, not that you could tell in black and white, but cause like originally his jacket was like a brown suede or leather or something like that. But then they, they had to do it in color and then you get the infamous red to get punched it up. Yeah. They punched it up into red. Cause that red is very vibrant. Oh yeah. Yeah. And all the kids, all the kids were wearing them. And it's iconic at this point as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, Because I picture, like, the cover of Rebel Without a Cause where he's standing, pointing with, like, a cigarette in his hand. Yeah. Doing this in his hand. That's what, when I think of James Dean, I think of that. Yeah. Um, I also picture him riding a motorcycle in black and white. His personal life, he was, like, he got into or whatever. That's how he died. Well, so he died. uh, I'm pretty sure the story was he left I'm pretty sure he was just wrapping up on the Be Giant, and he's speeding down the highway to go to a race, I think it was, and someone turned left um, when they shouldn't, well, you know, as the story goes, they turned left when, you know, you know, you know, person going straight gets the right away or whatever, right? And to be fair, it was, it was the 1950s and there were no traffic laws. Oh, <laughs> not, not, you know, yeah. It's weird how, like, things in the past, because, you know, you're just thinking about it, so it's like, you're living now, and so you just kind of associate with now. Yeah, uh, seatbelts weren't invented until like the seventies. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I saw a video. I saw a video of a Canadian being asked about it, and they were like, "You don't have to, I don't want to put a. I don't want to put a seatbelt on. I get a doctor's note, and it's the same thing as masks right now. You know, seatbelts. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Nice. The same. The same thing happened in Canada when seatbelts were rolled out. Uh, when the laws started to come in, they're like, you can't make me do it. I'm not going to wear a seatbelt. Just like because I'm not. Masks. Yeah, exactly. You can't tell me what to do. Keep your laws off my body. <laughs> That's not. No. That's a little different. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so Natalie Wood, as I, was, I just wanted to finish my thought on her. She reminded me a lot of Mila Kunis. Uh, she's the one from that 70s show, right? Yeah. Why do you say that? Just like she looked like her and kind of sounded like her. Look like her, kinda. No, kind of sounded like her, like a night, like a nineteen fifties version of Mila Kunis. Man, Mila, uh, like nineteen seventy person, like seventies girl, like. Her, that's true. Her, I don't, I don't see it. That's okay, fine. fair enough. Do you think George? Uh, do you think uh, what's his name? Who wrote The Breakfast Club? Howard, not Howard Hughes. Let's <laughs> back in here. John Hughes. John Hughes. I think John Hughes took a lot of uh, a lot of inspiration from this movie because the thing about his movies is they're always like fun family comedies or teen dramas or teen comedies, but they always have a message. And at the end of the day, the message of this movie is teenagers go through a lot of shit anyway, uh, but their home life is the extension of that. It is where the the, the starts and end. Yeah, and these three people these three people that kind of come together, we don't actually get to see what Buzz's life is like. Well, I assume shit. Uh, the goon crunch or whatever, those guys are his lackeys. Yeah. One of them's played by Dennis Hopper. I don't know if you noticed that. Oh, I noticed it. And I got plenty of stories for you when we get to that part, but go on. Okay, cool. Um, when they, when they kind of come, the three of them kind of come together, I realized that these three people all have fucked up home lives. Uh, James Dean is kind of, he's kind of like a, fixated he's angsty he's fixated on like real first world problemy things like oh my dad's a pushover my mom's a bitch like whatever that's (laughs) that's not that big a deal when you compare it to natalie wood it has a real incestuous uh uh relationship with her father but i don't i don't think it's meant to be incest 
I think it's meant to be like, she won't grow up. And he's like, it's gross, but she can't see that because she's mentally like a, uh, like, a, a, what's not just Don Draper's wife, who's like a baby in her head. Uh, oh, that sounds familiar. You know, from Mad Men, fucking, what's her face's character? Yeah, Betty Draper. I don't Betty Draper. Betty Draper is like, a, she never aged past 12 inside of her head. And she acts like it, like she kind of has like a weird thing with a kid. You know, and she can't like wrap her head around like basic shit. And I feel like now uh, Judy has this same problem. And then when you get to Plato or John, he's like his parents are just gone. Like he's he's a rich kid. His parents have bounced completely. Yeah. Well, so I wrote down they all have daddy. So oh yeah, his dad left. I guess like he was still with his mom, but she was always on trips or whatever. Uh, Natalie, um, like, yeah, like she's still like, she, it definitely had a weird incestuous vibe or whatever, uh, kissing and shit. Like, oh, how come we don't do it anymore or whatever? It's like, oh, you're too old for that. It's like, he's a pedophile or some shit. Um, uh, but like, I think you're right. I think it, I don't think that was actually the underlying, uh, what they were trying to get across, but yeah, just like you said, like a young girl who, you know, loves her dad or whatever. And they used to be more um, um, like compassionate or whatever. And then now she's getting older and it's time for her to grow up and stop doing that kitty stuff or whatever kind of thing. And, and what really what really underlined it for me in that moment was when her her brother Bo jumped up on the sun flat. He was being like playful and giving him a kiss and being like very fatherly. And she got visibly jealous. Yeah. That's what made me go, oh, it's not some weird shit that the director was trying to, or the writer, or the screen rip playwriter was trying to get in there about incest yeah it was that she hasn't aged up to 16 years old yet she's still like 12 and daddy's little girl little girl yeah exactly and then yeah. jp uh wants his dad to stick up for himself and stop being like a little pussy or whatever and uh yeah so they all like i I just wrote down they all have daddy issues. hey that that works uh i think that the, my problem with jim's character like he's only angsty because he's 16 like, that's the same well, angst you know, I had when I was 16. He, well, actually, I guess he caused problems in the last, like, town or whatever, but they're new to this town. It's uh, right around Easter, whatever that is, or something. So they're new to this town. He's the new kid, and he's, like, he wants to try and fit in with the cool kids. Yeah. And, like, he makes, you know, makes the sounds during the... Um, uh, the planetarium? Planetarium, yeah. The... Well, that's... See, what I, what I noticed with that is when he leaves for school on that first day, his dad kind of gives him a speech that's like, don't let your friends pick you, pick your friend. Yeah. And that sort of lies with the whole idea that, like, you can't pick your friend, you know, you you, you fall in with who you're going to fall in with. Yeah. But before he actually starts to pursue that group of street tests, I kept referring to them in my notes, <laughs> he, that Plato finds him first. Plato finds him and he fucking is like yo yo dude stay away from them they're bad news yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 he literally meets the street toughs before plato because he walks outside and then he meets judy and then he she goes with the boys they, they drive off action. and they troll them yeah there's like the world's first trolling yeah. <laughs> it's that way it's that way it's that way yeah. um but he but you can see it's all very playful and that like weird knife fight is the like do you want to just like go through the movie? The, you do yeah. Okay, yeah. Let's start. Let's start from the beginning. Then we'll go. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. What kind of uh, what kind of format do you want for this? Because there's well, we have a half hour, so we've kind of jumped all over the place, but we haven't gotten into it. There's a lot of stuff that happens in each scene. This mo movie has a lot of content, and yeah. when you when you said let's do this movie, I was like, movies from the 1950s are an or 70 minutes, but this fucking movie is an hour and 50 minute runtime. And the credits, the credits are at the beginning, and then there's no real like end credits. Just as the end, because the way movies were structured back then. I don't so like you get credits over people's face or like over a scene or whatever. But there wasn't really a scene. It was just him wasted. <laughs> yeah, he, he was like you know, middle of the night, drunk, you know, stumbling home and finds a little toy monkey to play with. And then you know the way that they they bring it back, he tucks in the monkey with like the little like newspaper or whatever. There, he's tucks in because he's like. He almost has paternal instincts or whatever, right? Like he, he's trying to, he wants his father to stand up, but like, he, and you know, he wants a dad to look up to, but that, and he also demonstrates like, you know, those paternal instincts as well for others, yep. like for Plato as well. Well, that's why Plato clings to him. Because 
Plato doesn't have that figure. He even says to says to Judy at one point, he's like, you know, me and him are best. He's my best friend. You know, he's kind of like my my dad figure. He'll be well. He doesn't say that, but he's like, I hope you take me hunting and fishing this summer. Yeah. She's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> we're yeah. as, we're you're 15 and we're 16. Like that. Like what are you taught? What? And then he keeps going on and on. And then later, you know, he even tucks him in. Yeah. In the mansion. Yeah. But just, okay. So we've covered, we start with, we start with him drunk and passed out. They, the cops pick him up. Then we're in the movie. Yeah. John's there. Uh, Judy's there and they're all there. So they've all been taken in for different reasons. John fucking is a psycho. Yeah. He's got the puppies, puppies. That's played out. Yeah. Also, also, when he's talking to the officer or whatever, he's like, my, I think he said, uh, my friends call me Plato or people call me Plato or something like that. I forget the, how exactly he said. I'm like, I'm like, who are you talking about? Like, you don't hang out with anyone. Who called? Like, you just made, you gave yourself a nickname. Right. <laughs> yeah. The only person you have is me and I'm, I'm the housekeeper. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's the 50s and I'm black. So. <laughs> I got my own shit to deal with right now, kids. <laughs> Judy gets um, walking the streets, which made me laugh. Yeah, and they keep trying to be like, were you out there looking for a friend, looking yeah, for yeah. Uh, some company? And she's yeah. like, no, I just need to get out of the house. My mom's being a bitch, and I want to bang my dad. <laughs> <laughs> that's not, we've already gone over why that's not what happened. But still, but about it. it's still fun. To, it, incest is one of those rare bad jokes that still toe the line a bit um no that's in we're going to take away our incest joke but aids is almost funny so you know what helpful yeah (laughs) it's jared and he's got his aids with him (laughs) um but yes okay uh uh, to the top state that's where we meet our three main characters yep um i like when jim is pulled into the office and he's humming flight of the valkyries while they're like trying to like explain to the cop that like it's fine he he just you know i used to go out and party when i was a kid but the cop ray he's very straight laced and very chill about all of it except for he's just like yeah he i really like that he takes jim like we'll get to it but he takes jim aside and he's like you can come talk to me about any of this stuff because the dad he's not a reliable person and then the mom is influenced clearly by i assume her mother I assume the grandmother is her mother because th- there's like a hierarchy in that household. Yeah, that it's a trickle down, and we see that we see that the next morning. Uh, but just to finish out this scene, um, the cop, the uh, sorry, I lost my spot here. She also left. Uh, Judy left behind a little. By the end of it, I think it was a c- hey, cigarette case. Oh uh, yeah, I'm not too sure what it was. Yeah, I wrote it down as a wallet, but women didn't have wallets in the fifties. That's for sure. I thought it was a notebook. Yeah, but I think it was a cigarette holder. I thought it was a makeup thing. Okay. Um, we also get a full on You're Tearing Me Apart, which Tommy Wiseau would go on to famously Jack because yeah. he loved James Dean so much. Oh, yeah. Now you can see why. Yeah, I can. But the context behind that now is like James Dean has three movies and Tommy Wiseau trying to make a whole film career out of that. It's insanity. We're going to have to do, maybe we don't do The Room, but we find something else Tommy Boy so to do, because I can't sit through that movie again. I still haven't watched it. I watched Disaster Artist. It was awesome. I haven't watched the, I feel like I want to watch it with someone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No? In that case, I'd be willing to watch it again. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, well, I would be, because it's a rare situation where I've seen a movie and you haven't. You never, like, you always, you've seen every fucking movie that we talk about so i'm the one that's getting an education from you and when we could the one time that we were like let's watch a movie neither of us have seen it was like it wasn't a disaster but we were both bored yeah it didn't, uh, it didn't work out the best it didn't work out the best i would go on to like i love that movie i watched it again and i i definitely like it back but in the time in that era i not really got this figured out either like we hadn't really gone it together to to to, to do this format but so anyway, Eels, <laughs> you're tearing me apart, which was fucking incredible. Uh, this is where I noticed that he looks like he's 30 years old, playing 30? 16 years old. Yeah, he fucking has crow's feet. He's got like he's got one of these uh, expression foreheads. Yeah. Um. So the then Ray takes him away from his parents into another room, 
and Jim fucking hauls off and takes a swing at the cop. The cop misses narrowly, no, uh, not no, not narrowly at all. He, yeah, he moved him. <laughs> He's like, if you're mad, hit this desk, punch this desk, give her. He punches the desk a bunch, then kind of chills out a bit. And that's when I cut back now, but that used to be my thing. And I think, I don't even think I saw this with that time or whatever. Like when I would get angry, I would like punch walls or whatever and shit. Fuck out my hand. And then uh, Kid Cuddy had a line about it in one of his songs. Like, oh man, these guys know what I'm talking about. I'm not crazy. We all have share some. I knew what you were talking about too. We used to talk about the way we worked at uh, Boston Pizza and we were super pissed. Yeah. I had a bone fragment floating in my in my knuckle for years because I would go, I would get pissed off after a, after a shift, after a rush, I would go outside and punch the hardest thing I could find because pain made it. Well, I'm, I've never really been like that. It was because pain made the rage go down a little bit for some reason. That's true. That's true. Um, I used to go into the walk-in fridge and just punch holes in boxes too. Yeah. Yeah. When I was raging. Uh, which I assume you did as well because we had to go into the same walk-in. Yeah. Um, I, I, stole, I stole meatballs once in a while. Whenever there was a fresh batch of meatball. Awesome. <laughs> Before that job, I worked at Boston Pizza, and we would go to reflections and party until the bar, the bar closed, and the oh, like the opening prep person would already be working, yeah. and we would go we would go into Boston Pizza and fire up the oven and cook a bunch of shit. Yeah, there are no cameras and cook a bunch of stuff and then bounce. It was awesome. It was incredible. It was incredible. Um, there's no way that I can get fucked over for admitting that, right? <laughs> uh, well, I was just thinking, how does um, how does uh, what's the statute? It's like 25 years. <laughs> so we haven't hit it yet, but it's not really even a it's not really even a crime. Somebody let me in to a place I worked 15 years ago. I mean, you would have, uh, I don't know. Crime sounds like a strong word. Yeah. But like, yeah, can you incriminate, let's say yourself after you get in trouble? Yeah. If I killed somebody four years ago and I was like, I killed that guy, I would go to jail. Well, I mean, that sounds a little serious. But like, when if I said right now, I, I was just from a retail place. No. I think you, there's no, unless that place cho- heard that and chose to sue me. Press charges. Yeah. Yeah. Prosecute you. Yeah. Um, but when we make it big, I'll pay all you guys back. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure, pretty sure HMV has gone out of business no, for no, no, years no, at this point. No. <laughs> it's, it's for my own boys. Your buddy worked there. Fuck it. I love TV. And I used to, so this is how I came through the, I'm pretty sure this is how I came about this. I first saw the James Franco movie, James Dean. And yeah. cause I had a man crush on James Franco and I was like, Oh, like, and I've heard James D before. I'm like, let's check this out. And. James Franco is awesome. He's kind of like another James. And, oh, yeah. Like, in real, like, just literally, like, as an actor or whatever. And uh, and then, so, in that movie, like, it, it shows, like, some of the different movies he did. And I'm like, oh, man, those look dope. So I bought the actual. And uh, I'm like, shit, now I realize why it was uh, such a, you know, uh, everyone talks about it a little bit. He's, uh, unfortunately, James Franco has a penchant for underage girls. And Seth Rogen and Seth will never work. What? When did yeah. that happen? Well, a thing came out a few years ago. Uh, but now with can people getting canceled all the time, Seth Rogen has said, I'm not, I'm done working with James Franco, which sucks because they're one of those epic duos in film. I, um, just, yeah, I think both, I think both apply here. Well, like, like, well, what in the States though, isn't it 18 or something? It's like each state is different. Okay. Yeah. I mean, some I find that weird anyway. I mean, I like, and so I'm not going to get in trouble with that, but. I like age appropriate women. Also, I'm married, and I've never, I, I've never tried to date anybody that was more than a couple of years. That's the thing, right? Like, I don't know. I, I don't know the like the what the what the whole story is, but that, I'm sorry to hear that. How's Maddie doing? She's good. I don't know if you can see her. I can't. Oh, there we are. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, the next scene um, is the part where James is saying that. He's telling Ray that the cop is, or that his dad is too nice. Um, and he's like, you know, my dad should give her a good smack. <laughs> but the thing is, I, I took that, that. I took, I took that as a total metaphor. I didn't take that as like a literal punch, even though I know it was because it was the fifties and that was sort of how you dealt with your women. <laughs> but, um, 
Madison didn't like that. Um, <laughs> these are just jokes. These are just jokes for the live. Where they where we're playing characters. I know she knows. Uh, fuck yeah, yeah. He says you should give her. Uh, you should just. Uh, I have it ran somewhere actually. One second. One second. Uh, blah blah blah. La la la. Company. Daddy is siren. Uh, daddy issues tear me apart. Uh, get your wife to make her happy and stop picking on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which fuck. So anyway, the cop gets kind of gets through to him and says, "You gotta, you know, you can come see me anytime." I know home life sucks, but home life's a drag. You just got to deal. So the next day, Jim sees his girl. It's the first day of school. But fuck that grandmother, because it's clear that she influences the mom to be a bitch to the dad. Right. It's that old trope where the grandmother takes credit for things, is constantly correcting the mom, lives with them, um, and the dad is not even... Okay. The other reason I bring her up in that way, though, is because there's a painting of her that he kicks. Yeah, that he kicks, and that wasn't that wasn't put in the movie just for like a fun little moment. That was put in there to to hit home that this grandmother is causing all the turmoil in this household because the mom is constantly crying and mad, and the dad is constantly like he's clearly been beaten down for years and years. That that's the vibe I got. Yeah. So um, they're gonna take a trip to we already talked about how they trolled trolled him uh we get to the he, school there's that mo- i talks to her offers driver to school or whatever she's going with little kids hey where's you know the school or the street or whatever it is this way this way no it's this way this way we all have a good laugh he's still so he get- finds his way to school and yeah. like it's a terrible foul by walking <laughs> I thought that kid was going to come back. I thought he was a teacher, but because everybody, I can't tell the ages of anybody in <laughs> movies, but he was clearly just the nerdy kid. It was just like, don't you do that. Because he didn't, it, it didn't feel like aggressive. It just felt like he wanted to follow the rules and he looked very, very dweeby. Um, and then he sees the puppy killer uh, and they have a little bit of a moment at the locker, I think. I think that was that moment where he's like combing his hair and he's out of, out of I noticed that. <laughs> so, on rewatching, and I don't think there's anything ever, like, officially, like, stated about it, but, like, there are, like, underlying tones of, like, um, you know, addressing homosexuality or whatever and shit like that, which... And they, they couldn't really be full on with it yeah. this time, but the, the <laughs> father-son thing was kind of the, their way of skirting it a bit. Yeah. There was rampant homosexuality going on in, in 1950s Hollywood. I wouldn't be surprised if James Dean was actually a, a gay man. You know what I mean? Well, like the story. Well, if anything, he might be bisexual or whatever. Cause I guess he had a grown like that. Uh, but that could just be like a beard. <laughs> right. There was some, there's some stuff in that James Dean movie that addresses that. Right. Maybe we should watch that fucking movie. I, I was going to mention it. It might, I well, I, maybe not right after the one though, but I'm definitely in all the movies that were, I hope we watch and review. Um, that'll be one of them. But yeah. no, apparently the at the very flirted with some, you know, some executives or whatever to like get a, you know, get ahead in, in his career or whatever. Get yeah, to give some head to get ahead at Hollywood. Am I yeah, out? Exactly. There's a, there's a show on Netflix. I'm not sure it's still on there. I forget what it's called now, but it's the, yeah, the Ryan Murphy show. I think it's called Hollywood. Yeah. It's, actually- it's good. Yeah. I watched the first uh, two episodes before I. The problem with Ryan Murphy is it always starts with a great idea and then he just gets too, he gets so fucking weird. Like I watched American Horror Story for many seasons and the longer it goes on, the more they get to the weirdness early in the first couple of seasons. It takes about, you know, the last act of the series to kind of get to the, what what are you you talking about? Yeah. By, By the time you get to the new seasons of that show, it just gets weird immediately. And it's too like, I'm not gay. So there's some stuff that probably goes over my head or like doesn't it doesn't it's not comfortable for me and it's not educational yeah it's just some more people that are in the lgp lgbtq plus community it, i might be wrong I, you know i might i might be biased i think um, i don't know if that's ignorant to say well no you, well you might ignorant you could be ignorant just in the sense that you don't know not ignorant is like oh it's a shit for now yeah. you just yeah yeah so now we get to the planetarium scene Planetarium sequence, which is basically the whole segment. 
<laughs> he, he, they're making jokes. Yeah, they're in the the planetarium scene. I want to say, I want to say, is probably the best special effect I've seen in a movie before, like 1970. Oh, what the swirly thing? The swirly shit. The like, the like how it like it rises up and climaxes, and everybody's like kind of scared. Like, I bet, a, I bet in the 50s. Um, I'll get to this more when we get to the chicken scene, but the the chicky run. The chicky run. Uh, there was nothing to do. There was there was nothing to do. The the we have the internet now. We have video games. They had the drive-in and telephone and radio, and that's it. I, I think they had a hoop stick as well. I think they had a hoop and a stick. I think they had a can we kick. Yeah. <laughs> I. They had pog. They had pog in the forties and fifties because it was milk caps. Yeah. So there you go. Um, but so. so- the cool kids, so the cool kids that make like a, they crack a joke about the constellation or whatever, and then so you know Jimmy, you know hearing this and wanting to try and you know impress them, you know uh, then he does the moo thing for the that that um, uh, constellation or whatever it was that comes Bolt, with. Chorus, yeah. yeah. And then that ticks off. The, it's like who the fuck is this guy? Yeah. And I always thought though Buzz was kind of into it. I think Buzz was like. He he he's the leader. He's got to keep up appearances. He might been a little bit like he might feel a little bit intimidated by by the new kid in town, who's also like a handsome, tough guy. Yeah. So um, about that much more. But it never felt like they don't like oh they don't gang beat him up like no. how it usually happens in a movie with the new kid coming to town. No, so he's like immediately want to initiate him. Yeah. Into their gang. Yeah. And that's sort of what happened. They. They so you you think it's gonna get real bad. They oh, because remember at the cliff he says I like you. He's like, well, yeah. what? Gotta do, like, gotta do something. And that's another. That's exactly what I'm. I want to get to after we get to this. Yeah. So they he goes outside. He's sitting with with Plato. Plato's just like gushing at how he how much he wants to like go party with this dude in this abandoned mansion. Jim's like, eh, I don't know if that's my theme. Then the whole group, the two goons come. Dennis Hopper's name is literally goon in this movie, which I thought was great. Um, or on that, the, he looks a lot taller in this too. I don't know if it's like he just he looked really tall. Look, he looked like a good looking guy back in the day. Yeah, I agree. I was I noticed that as well. He he was like he's really clean cut. He could play a villain or a hero. I think. Yeah. But two lagoons come and see him, and they go back and tell the rest. And the whole group comes down, and they swarm around Jim's car and fucking stab the tire, which was a little bit extra. She have smashed a window or done something like world at last like in that place. Expensive. I feel like it would be hard to replace. Yeah, I guess. Uh, the the I guess what happens too is Jim goes down the stairs. He's keeping it cool. He opens the trunk like he's gonna like replace the tire. When they stabbed the tire, did you like how exhaled as well? He was like like that. I didn't notice that. That's good. That's good cinematography. Like that's good writing. Yeah. That also Jim apparently had a lot of um a lot of like control or like a lot of say in, in this movie. Um, as far as like, cause like, uh, as far as like him and the relationship he had with the director and, uh, he would take over scenes sort of, so to speak. But anyway, so yeah, plunger's attire. So then Jim's keeping it cool. Fucking Buzz calls him a chicken. And the reason they're in this new town is because they had to leave because he fucked up some kid for calling him a chicken. Yeah. Like, Don't you fucking call me a chicken. And Buzz is like, fine, if you're not a chicken, check this out. Pulls out a switchblade. And he's like, he's like, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take some swipes at you but i'm gonna give you a knife too and you're gonna take some swipes at me you're not gonna we're not gonna stick each other we're gonna going to basically spar with yeah. with switchblades we're gonna have a sword fight like yeah. like two like a fencing that two rapiers sword fight like this was total swashbuckling action i thought i thought this was like this was like the the cinematic equivalent of like a big scene in a play in a pirate play where two pirates go at it with rapier. I didn't think of that, but I like that. That's that's good. I like that. It was, this movie is very, like, it's clearly based off a play. It's very big. All their movements are very big. All the all the lines are very, very well written. It's not right. like dial. The dialogue doesn't feel like in modern movies where it's two people talking to each other. But yeah. It's all very drenched in metaphor. Yeah, yeah. There's, so there were... There was a book, there were two kind of main inspiration. Well, there was two, um, so there's a book written by, I think it was a doctor or something, it was like studying some criminal kid, psychopath or whatever, 
which was like the main bulk of, or not the main bulk of the story, but like kind of gave the inspiration of, you know, troubled youth kind of thing. And then there was the, I'm pretty sure it was the director, he wrote something where it talked about um, uh, racing each other and the first person to, um, you know, move the chicken or whatever, first person like turn out of the way. And then there's also a bit of inspiration almost from Romeo and Juliet with yeah. the worlds kind of thing. Um, and then a little bit of like a Peter Pan, like never, never land, like not wanting to grow up or like, you know, just like the child innocence kind of thing. Yeah. And the, uh, the chicken thing, speaking of Ryan Murphy in the first season, um, there's a ghost who's played by, uh, the, what's his face? Um, he's in every, he plays the, plays Quicksilver from X-Men. Yeah. With the uh, rest of whatever. No, not not in the Avengers, not in the MCU, the X Men oh, movies. Yeah, the other one. Uh, Ethan, uh, like I never remember his fucking name. I don't look like the guy from. Uh, yeah, uh, Evan Peters. Um, Evan Peters dies in a, in one of those situations. It's like either they're playing the chicken where you go at each other, or the off the cliff chicken. Yeah, and that's sort of his. He's tethered to the earth because of that. And I and I kept thinking about that because this version of chicken, he gets there. He's like, we're going to play chicken. He says the line you say where it's like, what else is there to do? There's literally nothing else to do, but fucking risk your life. <laughs> Someone to- get, get, get the PlayStation 5. Seriously, get them a fuck. Invent Pong 20 years previously so they don't drive off a cliff. Anyway, they do the chicken thing. Fucking uh, Jim Bales, no problem. But no, Buzz get the... So now the thing, I'm pretty sure it was going with Buzz, right? Is that the yeah. That's good vibe. But she also was like, like, so when they're at the car, for example, she was like, you know, posing, like kind of like flirting with them or whatever, right? Like trying to give off that vibe. I'm like, are you with this guy? Like, why are you trying to show off to this guy? And then so, and then they do the, the they're doing the chicky run. She goes up to Buzz or whatever, hooks him up with the dirt. And, and then it's crazy. Like, yeah. That's the scene that's on my television right now. Me too. Oh, nice. When did you start? When did you start? Just like a couple minutes before yeah. we started. And just, I did what we did last week where I put on uh, so I could look over and if I forgot what we were talking about, I'd be able to look. Nice. That's a good idea. But it's lined up almost perfectly with where we're at in the movie. He's like, let's do though. And she's like, what? Like some dirt. And he does like his weird little thing. But yeah, so then for the chicky run. And, uh, but, but Jim makes it. Jim makes it no problem. He jumps out. They do it. They did a weird special effect where he duck and rolls. Clearly, they had it slowed down to like yeah. you know, they but then they sped it up and it. Sped up it the, uh, the... But it looks really cool. It looks really good. Uh, even though when they're yeah. driving, it's clearly a, it's clearly green screen or whatever blue screen, whatever they used back then, the or or literally just like <laughs> like no, when they're driving, the background is oh. probably just two cars on a track that are just being like pushed backwards and forwards like this. And then they didn't have green screen technology. They had literally, you just have like a big, uh, like, like sheet with the painting of the background on it. That was just going around on two spools. So anyway, fucking buzz gets his jacket caught on the door. He can't get out. The two cars go over. They're stolen cars. We forgot to point that out. So go ahead. I was going to say, when you get a jacket stuck on the door, like when they show it from, from his point of view, like you can see like the loop of the thing and his things there. But then when they show it looking up at him from like behind the steering wheel, he has that hand that's stuck on the steering wheel, like over here. And then he's trying to do this over here. But anyway, my, biggest, gone, so he gets the my biggest problem with that moment is slam the brake thought at least. <laughs> Was he too far to just like, I'll just put the brakes on. You know, it might have been, it might have been, it, what, like, he wasn't, he was so frantic that he couldn't, pro, like, process that thought properly. Maybe. Or maybe cars didn't have brakes yet in the 1950s. <laughs> I think it was a, I think it was a Ford Mercury. I think it was, I think that was the car. Oh, really? Cool. Shit, we only have, like, 10 minutes left. Man, let's, <laughs> we, we don't have to be constrained by 10 minutes. Keep going. All right, cool. Um, this is Jack. So, yeah, he so, fucking he, dies. Now he's now now he haunts now he's haunting that fucking bluff forever. Yeah. Not really. That's not part of the movie. That's my head cannon. I was like, <laughs> the way this the way this movie ends is like it's not what I thought was gonna happen. And I was like, oh, so the, the, their life just keeps going after this. Anyway, we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, 
but that's in my head i was like oh well he's, he's haunting that bluff now so all the kids that go there to play go on a chicky run are gonna get haunted by buzz from, from now on i really like buzz i really like the way he looked he played the most non-threatening leader of a pack character while still and i like imposing it was imposing and menacing but also like I can see why he wanted to be bros. Yeah. Jim. Yeah. It, it wasn't that bad. The stabby thing really wasn't that menacing. It was weird. It was definitely weird. But it plays into the whole, like, they're not going to, they have nothing better to do than r- risk it all <laughs> for a girl. What? It wasn't for a girl, though. Kinda. I don't think. Yeah, it was for masculinity. Yeah. Okay. Which is usually related to a girl. Yeah. Well, okay. Hold on. <laughs> so, anyway, he fucking flips out. They they drive all. He he drops her off. She's I can see her swooning right now. <laughs> She's like, oh yeah, but he, uh, he, Jim and Plato are like, what are we gonna do? And Jim's just kind of like, I don't care. I don't have many feelings. I'm an antagonist from Last a night. Japanese role playing game. That's what? Right? Oh, when he gets home, he tells his parents what happens and that he wants to tell the cops. But yeah. his parents don't want him to go to the cop, which seemed like almost the opposite of what, you know, parents are. <laughs> yeah. And I thought it was funny that he immediately just tells his parents everything. Yeah. He was just like, yeah, this is what happened. All this happened. And his mom is horrified. And his dad's like, well, you know, like, well, I mean, let's just uh, keep it on the down low and just uh, yeah. not. Uh, rock the boat too much. Uh, as you can see, I've married a nightmare person, and uh, I I didn't want to just because we skipped over that scene too, where Jim gets home before he goes back out, and I don't know why. Just as an aside, Jim keeps every time he has like his emotional moments always come when he's standing in front of the fridge, slamming milk, just just slamming a fucking liter of milk, a glass. Anyway, a glass liter of milk. So it looks very non homogenized. Like the fat is, the fat is at the top, uh, but he go and he hears like a crash, and his dad is like bringing a whole meal to his mom. Yeah, he's wearing like the fucking wearing the apron, like the woman's apron. It's very bizarre. He's he's the most pussy whipped individual I think I've ever seen. Ever, yeah. Um, and he's like, you gotta do something. To, I don't like seeing my dad like this. This is fucking weird. Yeah. He's like, oh, I'm a son. He's like, they yeah, they joke that he dropped it. And then, and then he's like, "Oh, I better pick it up." He sees it, and he's like, "No, like letters, leave it. <laughs> Let me see it." And I like how when at the end of that, when he's like, he's like trying to pick him up, and he's trying to find the words, but he can't think of them, and walks off. I felt that was really that felt really real and genuine. That usually, yeah. usually in like movies these days, there'd be a little bit more dialogue going there, but I like the way that they. Did. Yeah, he just slammed the milk on the the video that I'm watching in the background here. <laughs> I like milk. I like the. I like milk. Um, uh, uh, you know what? I I kind of I don't like. I mean, like I never really drank milk on its own, but I definitely cereal a lot. And then you drink the milk at the end. Uh, people who never finish off their milk drive me insane. Like the bottoms is like the best part where all the good set. Crazy, crazy people out there. Uh, but like I don't really drink milk anymore. Sometimes I'll put some in my coffee. I put a little bit of cream in my coffee, but I like, I will drink glass of milk. Sometimes, like Madison will chocolate. have to buy me. Oh, all all day with the chocolate milk. Regular milk, though, I can't enjoy but of having a glass of it. Like it's hard to oh, explain. Yeah, I like it. Sometimes Madison has to buy regular milk for like a recipe, but she's not going to use the whole shit. Recently, she bought a two liter of of non homogenized milk. I haven't been drinking yet. Like fucking weird. So maybe that's on me. I learned it from watching my dad. My dad loves a glass of milk. My grandfather, both of my 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 alive grandfather and my deceased grandfather, both loved a glass of milk. You know? She bought two liters. Did he need a liter and a half? No, she needed like a cup. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't sell not a much nice milk in like a one liter oh, here. Oh. At least it's COVID time, so I don't go to the grocery store. I just go to the shop, like the closed shoppers on my block. So it's kind of closer because it's closer, and grocery stores fucking wake me up right now. Why? What's the difference between that and the Stuka? Because it's more, there's more people at the grocery store. It's bigger. Doesn't your whatever go to that store? No, the shoppers is usually pretty dead. Okay, fine. I'm telling you, I don't know what it is. Why are they? I bet, uh, we'll do a live together. 
hold my hand and walk me through the fucking the fucking grocery store. So uh, Jimmy goes to tell the cops. I think. Well, before that, she go. Judy goes home and she's all distraught and she's messed up. Um, and then yeah, and then we already went through the part where he tells his 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 folks about everything. Yeah, and um, he kissed the or no. Yeah, the mom like won't even hear it. Was it was something I wrote down that I'm noticing now? She doesn't even like. She won't even like register what he's telling her because she's so like oblivious. The reason too is he. Did you notice how she's like? I was gonna take a sleeping pill, but you weren't home yet. She's clearly all zooted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he takes pills to get up in the morning and go to bed at night. There's a lot of stuff in this movie that's really like like modern storytelling, like modern filmmaking. I feel like you've enjoyed this movie and it makes me happy. I liked it a lot, okay? <laughs> I didn't expect I expected it to be bored. I thought it was gonna be in black and white. And I'm fine with that for yeah. short movies. They wanted to. They were gonna make it a dude, this movie is blockbuster written all over it. They could re release it right now and it would still hold it holds up very well. It's just some of the diet like some of the language yeah. doesn't. Yeah, it's just what they call something or something. Oop yeah. Yeah. I wrote down takes of cake. I don't remember what part that is, but I think Jimmy was stopped, but was still, I think it was, I think that's what happened. I, I just wrote down, takes a piece of cake, but my guess is Jimmy was his stop, but he still cut himself a cake. I oh. <laughs> before the you tell the cops. Yeah. Yeah. So he, yeah, he goes to the police station. The goons see him enter. He just wanted to go in there and talk to Ro- like Roy, but Roy wasn't there. We don't ever really find out why he was going to the, the police station. He wanted I to- think he was going to. Because the copper told him if ever you to talk to me. Right? Yeah. yeah. But that's as far as that thought went with me. Like, I thought he was just going to go ask for advice. But asking for advice would have to mean that he would have to tell the cop what happened. Potentially. He could potentially. He could probably talk around it, spoke in general. That's true. But as we both know, stitches get snitches. Nope. <laughs> no, that's, 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 that's what the saying is, perf. Uh, yeah. So the cop's not there. The goons lie in wait. Jim calls Judy, yeah. right? Her dad answers, I don't know, no, Jimmy. <laughs> um, so then he goes to see Judy, and the fucked up, the, the they kind of like figure out they like each other, and they talk about being kids, and they talk about how fucked up this all is. The yeah. big thing that I noticed that was written into this movie that kind of blew my mind was Buzz had put a dedicated song on the radio. He had dedicated a song to Jim, and they comes on the radio... And it was like, this is a song dedicated to Jim from Buzz. I don't he turned off. You didn't catch that? You know, he turned off the radio like, what the fuck? What was- uh, it was just, it was big band music. It was big band music at the time. But yeah, God, that called the radio to dedicate a song to Jim. Yeah. Before he died. Right be- probably like right before he died, they were probably going to be in the same situation he was with Judy, them chilling and having a good time after. So this is only this is probably only an hour later yeah. at this point. Or an hour and a half later. Hour long would take like it seems like a small town. Also, the the space between the planetarium and that mansion goes from like it looks like pretty far away and in one direction to being like literally next door in another direction. Yeah. What whatever. Movie um Madden. Movie Mad. Oh yeah, fuck he fucking like tries to strangle his dad too. I love that. during that last scene. <laughs> That's that- it's like, stand up for yourself or I'll fucking kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I wrote haunting because that I was very haunted by that moment. I see where he grabs him, the energy. No, and the, the, him turning the radio off because it's like, and this next song dedicated to Jim but from Buzz. I got to check that out. I got to watch it again, though. Because it felt like from, it was felt like it was from Beyond the Great. Yeah, exactly. But clearly he called it in earlier. That's not how that works. Maybe it did back then. But yeah, usually it's like... And everyone's calling in to pick their song and then, you know... Or maybe he even said, can you play it at this time? Because it would be after the, the race. Yeah. Because, like, maybe they both get out and they, like, kind of shake hands and then they're all kind of friends. Because even, like, even when the two cars were over the cliff, Jim didn't know. Jim didn't know it was going to happen. What had happened. He was like, where's Buzz? And they were like, he fucking did not leave his car. Yeah, 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 exactly. Where, yeah, exactly. He comes up like, where's Buzz? He had a blast. Like, yeah, he felt like, it was, like you said, initiation. So, um, the, the, the rest of the gang, so Crunch and Goon, 
Now, Dennis Hopper, the post of business right-hand man crunch, but so Dennis Hopper used to go with Natalie Wood at the time, but the director, I guess, uh, hooked up with her or was hooking up with her or some shit like that. And Dennis Hopper caught them and got pissed and, uh, I guess challenged them to a fight and the director's like, fuck you, you're fired. <laughs> but that, uh, um, uh, Paramount or whatever was like, no, you know, you got to keep this guy in it or whatever. And so instead of firing him, they gave him like, uh, that, that, that third, third good role or whatever you want to call it kind of thing. Crunch. Yeah. Yeah. Crunch role and goon. Those are but fucking they, great. They, they, good they, they, yeah. So. Then we get Goon, uh, sorry, Plato rolling up to his house. The Goon squad sees him. They rough him up a bit. They steal his uh, address book. Yeah. Mind you, he didn't write it in the line. He has <laughs> yeah. three different address um, uh, section to write one address. That's for the, that's because it's a movie, you see. And you need to be able to see it on camera. But still, it drove me insane. <laughs> Uh, so then we, we get a moment with Plato that was really bizarre where you run, he like gets pushed into his house by the goons. The, the housekeeper scares them away yeah. and he just runs upstairs and starts looking through like mail and pulls out a check for $697, which I assume is his like it the money. It was, it was, it was child support from his dad. Okay. So he knows that the dad's never coming back. Then he pulls back the sheets and finds a gun. Yeah. Uh, was this his parents' room? His mom. So when I was first watching it, I'm like, whoa, why is Plato's room, you know, lace and pink? Yeah, like furly and pink and... Yeah, no, it was his mom's room. Mom's yeah, okay. So she has a gun just in her bed. But yeah, maybe... Uh, yeah. I don't know why it would go back into the same spot so you get access to it again. But anyway, he grabs the gun and leaves. Uh, so the goons have the address book. They go to Jim's house. The weirdest fucking yeah. thing I've ever seen. They knock on the door repeatedly, and his parents, Jim's parents, are kind of like, "They're just kids. They'll go away. I don't. I don't want to deal with this." And the dad's like, or the mom's like, "No, we have to go see what is happening." Yeah. And the dad's like, "No, nah, I don't want to. I don't want to mess around with that." He goes to the door. He looks through the thing, and they're not there. I don't know how he didn't see what what happened, but looks. He's like, "Who's there?" Nobody didn't see. Opens the fucking Open door. The door. <laughs> There's a chicken hanging there. A live chicken. And then the goons are just like standing off kind of in the distance, be like, hey, hey yeah, I'll teach him. We didn't teach him anything. It's weird to them out. So then they like home invade him, basically. He's like, he's not here. He's not here. Yeah. And then another funny scene is like, they go back to be like, is Jim here somewhere? And Plato shows up, and the dad's like, who are you? Because <laughs> <laughs> they have never met each other. Which I was like, this is uh, this is great because in a lot of movies they don't this continuity stuff like doesn't get addressed. But the fact that the dad is like, "Who are you?" was great. Like that was excellent storytelling because I've seen movies where there's two characters that never have never met each other, and for some reason they're talking to each other like they've known each other the whole time. Yeah. So that was great. Plato's like, "Uh, this is bad. Like this is a bad place to come." Uh, he bounces. Um. Uh, Plato realizes he they probably went to uh, they probably went to that mansion because back when Judy and Jim were having that conversation, he's like, I know this uh, abandoned mansion that Plato wanted to take me to after the planetarium. You want to go up there and uh, you know finger each other's bubbles, whatever kids do. <laughs> That's uh, it wasn't it wasn't overly sexual between them. They don't even they kiss like twice. Once that I can remember, but yeah. He kisses her on the forehead, and then they like finally kiss, and then they kiss at the like very, very end. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, that scene when they're laying together, she has a weird look in her eyes. Yeah, can put my finger on. Yeah. So this is the last sequence here. Um, and then we'll wrap her up. Like we're only gonna go about twenty minutes over. So I just my thing is that I don't want people to have to like sit through an hour and a half. That's fair. You know what I mean? Anyway, we should talk about format. Like in between, like off camera. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We spent a lot of time asking each other how our week was. Um, <laughs> so we get to the little action. Not at all. <laughs> I can't. That's the problem. If we could do this like podcast, yeah. if we did this like a podcast, we could cut that. But since it's what live, do I need for a podcast? we'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, Plato shows up. They all pal around, uh, is what I wrote down. Because basically, like, 
Jim, J- James Dean and, and, and Judy get inside by breaking the window. And then Plato shows up and he like looks through the broken glass. He's like, hey, what's going on? They go back and forth. And he's like, I'm here with Judy. Come on in. Then they, the three of them pal around and pretend they're a family. They just run around with like grab ass. It really reminded me of like in a movie where like the, the main group of friends get stoned or drunk for the first time. Yeah. But there was no drug or there was no drug or alcohol abuse in this whole movie. Back then. Like just like- feeling out at night was enough. <laughs> um they're fucked. They have a weird family dynamic dynamic. Uh and that's this is when I realized it's kinda like the breakfast breakfast club. Then Plato falls asleep face down in the in the dirt. <laughs> like Okay, uh, and the other two go explore. So then the goons show up. Yeah, they they go in. They see what's going on. They find Plato. Yeah, Plato manages to get stuck in the pool, like backed into the pool, the empty pool. Yeah, that they were paddling around in a minute ago. Which and then like tube of some sort, like a hose. Yeah, he pulls out a, tease, a hose and he's like fending them off with a hose. Now everybody who is supposed to be 16 in this movie except for Plato looks like they're 25 Plato actually looks like a kid well Natalie it, it was 16 um, I don't remember how old the actor he looked six, He looked 14 Yeah. Um, so they chase each other around then uh, he somehow escapes and he hides with the gun he's got the gun he hides with the gun Yeah. then the poli- we see the police are in the area they see that there's been a, like a break in at this place and the goons keep searching, and then Plato is fucking wigged out. He's losing it, and he shoots one of the goons. The goons coming down the stairs. He fucking shoots him. I think it was Chris or Crunch or whatever the fuck. <laughs> um, and then he takes a shot at Jim, who's coming. He's like heard the commotion. Come, comes around a corner, gets shot at, misses. Luckily, uh, and then that's when um, the cops actually show up. Jim sees the cops and he tries to get the fuck out of there. Yeah. Uh, and Jim and Judy are trying to like escape in the bushes and trying to like get away from there. Uh, but then Jim realizes like uh, he just Plato just wants a family. So I'm the only person that can talk to him right now. So it all it all comes to a head when they run all run to the planetarium, which, like I said, is like. Is it one mile away or is it ten feet away? Because they it made it like the some real ink. This continuity error there, yeah, but it's fine. They could have like it could have the host could have been closer than it seemed, and they could have just like run like if the host was here, like out here in the planet. Oh, the sun. Anyway, they yeah. could have run around, and it could have been closer that way. That's the only way it made sense in my head. That planetarium, oh, no. though, it's a very famous planetarium. It's in Grand Theft Auto Five. Yeah, it still exists to this day in Los Angeles. Um, it's really very cool looking. I didn't know it was a planetarium until this movie. I don't know if it was just that at one point and it's been other things or what. Yeah. Uh, so they, Plato breaks into the planetarium. Then the cops show up. Then Jim and Judy run into the planetarium and they sort of back down Plato into where the, the original movie or the display, I guess it would be called, took place. And Plato kind of won't come out of his hiding space. And Jim's like, look, look, bud, you got to come out. Can't talk to you if you're hiding. And he coaxes the gun away from him. He's just going to hold it for a sec. Let me hold it. Let me take a look. And he fucking gets the clip out and stashes the clip, yeah, which is excellent. And gives the, he kind of does that thing where he like hands him the gun. But like when Plato goes to grab it, he just like conversationally doesn't hand it to him a little bit. And I thought there was going to be a whole thing where there was still a gun in the, a bullet in the chamber. Yeah. That's not what did you think that too? Because that's that's the only reason I thought that they were doing this moment. I had a thought that there might have still been one of the two. But I guess not, because what ends up happening is Jim runs out because Plato's like, it's too bright. They're shining lights in here. I'm freaked out. Yeah. Jim's trying to be like, they're your friends. They just want to help you. Turn on Jim goes lights. out. He's turned off the lights, goes back, gets Plato to the door, and they see the glint of the gun because yeah. Plato's holding it against his chest still. And Jim's trying to be like, I have the clip. Like it's it's all good. And play, uh, Jim runs out or walks out slowly with his hands above his head. And I was like, he's wearing a white shirt. I was cinematically, I was like, fucking Jim's dead. And I thought, I re- even wrote in here, I was like, I can't tell if Jim is going to get shot or Plato is going to get shot. Uh, 
They are no supposed to get shot. Oh, really? Yeah, there is a different ending. Uh, written. Oh, crazy! Because what does have it happen is Plato runs out with the gun in his hand, and they the cops are cops, so they fucking shoot him. Yeah, and they kill him instantly. Hey, just like today. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, that's my cousin, uh, New Jack, the professional wrestler New Jack, passed away today. He was a piece of shit, so he won't be missed. Rest. Um, rest in power. Uh, <laughs> um, so. Jim obviously feels extremely, uh, extremely guilty. There was no communication, but it was a really tense situation. I wouldn't have been surprised if all three of them got shot. Yeah, honestly, it was so tense. Uh, and his dad is his the him and his dad finally have that moment that you know his dad is like consoling Jim, and his mom yeah. tries to he's like just stop, just stop for a minute, and yeah. you finally get that moment where his dad finally stands up for himself, and then fucking judy and jim just get into a cop car in peace and i guess have a life like, together uh, judy like i gotta point something out the yeah. last thing i wrote was what a day <laughs> this all happened was this all one day it's the night before this day is when they're all in jail and then the next day is this day yeah okay yeah 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 that is that is quite a dick that, that they're talk they're they talk multiple times about how they love each other and they met today Multiple times. It's like, you know, I at the very beginning, she says some shit to him, and he's like, well, I love you too. They just oh, okay. met. Later, later, she's like, is this what it means to love somebody? Do we love each other? And he's like, they kisses her. Yeah. And then they leave together at the end after this horrible thing happened to Plato. So, like, what a day. It did. I did. Like, I do find it has a, just got it ends on a weird story. Uh, so what was, what was the... Alternate ending. Ah, uh, they both got shot. Oh, and then it's Judy just like, bah! Uh, <laughs> I want Tim. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so that's uh, Rebel Without a Cause, Scalin. We got a, I'd say we got a couple minutes here to kind of wrap up and talk about our feelings. L- let me do a quick speed route. Let me do a quick speed route. Okay. Okay. So we talked about the inspiration it was based on. Uh, there was a, there was a draft. That was written by Doctor. Uh, funny enough, uh, Brando almost started. It. I saw Buzz was Brando when I first saw him, but then yeah, obviously it isn't him. But he almost started. Almost starting it as uh, Jimmy. Um, okay, and so it's kind of interesting that you know uh, he's James Dean's hero or whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, um, I mentioned about how it has kind of like that Romeo Juliet inspiration. Uh, Natalie Wood. So the director, like she was like trying to like, so she was like a child actor and, and then this part came along and she wanted, it's like, oh man, I gotta get that part. And the director's like, oh, you're, you're, you sweet, you're Dini Bopper, you're not, this isn't you or whatever. And, um, and then, so she got in an accident, um, and she was at the cop station or whatever. And she called the director to come pick her up instead of like her parents or whatever. Right. And, um, one of the officers called her uh, juvenile delinquent. And then so Drek comes back up. It's like, she just called me juvenile delinquent. Can I have the part now? And, uh, <laughs> and also they hooked up. And so uh, what else we got on here? Uh, I, talk, I talked about the East Eaton and Giant. Uh, the, so to audition the extra like gang member guys or whatever, they had like a hundred kids, a hundred or so, like a couple hundred kids come into audition for it, which they eventually whittled down to, I think it was about, 50 ish or something like that. And then they had them like basically tell them go get in the fight. Like pretend like kind of have a real fight, but like get in the fight. Yeah, they had them all switchblades and they were like, nope, go poke. I, Just play. I don't think they did <laughs> switchblades, but they definitely like threw each other into cars and shit. Like they anyway got whittled down to like the the, the lot that we see. Uh we talked about how it was it started out as black and white, but then yeah, Cinemascope had their uh claws or whatever in the contract it has to be color. Uh, uh, Jimmy had a lot of uh, like say on set as far as like direction and whatnot. Uh, we talked about Dennis Hopper and Natalie Wood and Uh, we talked about the so the when they had the switchblade fight, they were real, and uh, Jimmy um got cut with on one of the takes or whatever. And then so the director saw that he was bleeding and was and called cut. And then fucking Jimmy got pissed. It was like, don't fucking ever say cut. I'll tell you what the cut. I wanted to use that to get the, the make it real or whatever kind of thing or whatever, blah, 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 right? <laughs> uh, the original opening for it 
some guy, like not anyone specific to any of the characters, but like some dad or something was walking home at night with uh, some like Easter gifts and he gets uh, uh, attacked by some gang kids or whatever. And so the stuff that Jimmy's playing with is the shit that he dropped. And then uh, we talked about the ending. They were both supposed to die. Uh, T-shirt sales scored. Uh, the the abandoned house, the, the lady who owned it, the pool she basically got for free for like letting people film there or some shit like that. Okay. Uh, uh, there was a nuclear explosion the night of the chicky race, uh, not too far away from where they were. Uh, uh, and then Tommy was so loved the movie. Tell you love he's his favorite shit. He based his whole career around it. So that's my speed run. I uh I loved it. That was a great speed round. I would give that movie um solid three point five. I don't want to cop out and feel like I do that to every movie, but you know, I'll say, I'll say 3.8. I'm not going to give it a four because, uh, it's, it, there's some real bad stuff. It's also old. So a lot of filmmaking, there's a a lot of filmmaking that has really stepped up in this game for the time. It's a four, but my, but like my rating would be a 3.8. Okay. And I'm being generous. The... I do. I did watch the 1080p version of it, uh, in color and and it looks, it pops. It looks so good. Um, and the, there's, there's some stuff that I didn't care for. It's a little bit long. It's a little bit boring in part. They could have probably cut out 15 minutes and it wouldn't have changed the, the movie. Um, yeah, I liked it a lot. Thank you for the recommendation. Oh, uh, yeah. The, I, uh, I'm all, I'm drawn to a troubled eat or whatever, like trying to find their place in life or whatever and shit like that. And, um, so it definitely uh, speaks to me on that level. Uh, it is, um, I guess you could say dated, um, but definitely for its time, like I might even put it a little bit higher than a four. Uh, I'm entertained by it every time. Like I could watch it. Uh, it is a little slow. I'd agree with you there. It is a little slow, but I can still watch it now and still entertained by it. Uh, I, uh, I'll give it, uh, I kind of want to say four. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I can see that. Well, we will be back probably sooner than later again uh, with a, another premium selection for us to talk about. Um, we went a little long, but that's okay. We're going to do our best to make sure that people want to come through and check us out. Uh, we don't have any real social media for this yet. Basically, it's just my Instagram, but maybe we talk about um, figuring out a way to move this to a website or something. So it's, we're here queer get used to it uh for hey have you hey have you seen this hey did you see this one hey did you see this one for hey did you see this one i've been jason and this has been yeah. Kaylin. <laughs> and we we watched roll without a cause we'll uh we'll catch you next time dun, dun, dun. bye <laughs>